Recently, Advertising Week hosted a book launch for Ariana Huffington's new book, Thrive, at the Paley Center in Beverly Hills. As part of the event, I was invited to interview her and we discussed a wide range of topics from her new book. You know, you talked a little bit about your aha moment um, of what, why you wrote the book and about this third metric that you've, you know, that you focus on. I'd love to know, how did you come up with those four components to be what the third metric is? The first one is very obvious because well-being is the first thing that sacrifices the way we lead our lives. Especially women who are juggling jobs and children, we feel that we can be the last thing on the agenda. Um, for men too, I'm not saying it's different, but women tend to think that they can keep pushing themselves through everything. And I felt that we needed to remember what we are told on aeroplanes, you know, put your own oxygen mask first, and then we're going to be able to handle everything better. You know, it's so interesting because as I do different shows, the producers tell me their own stories. And I was, I was taping Queen Latifah yesterday, and the producer said to me, you know, I was reading the book and I actually put that into practice on Sunday. I was exhausted. Um, instead of going grocery shopping, I had a nap. And then she said, for some reason, the evening was so much better. She said, I was more present for my children. We did not starve. There was something to eat in the, in the house. <laughs> and so that's really the kind of thing that we begin to realize, that if we prioritize our own sense of well-being, it doesn't mean we're selfish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it means we're really wise in terms of putting our energy into everything else we're doing the right way and not being so irritable with our children. I know how I was, you know, when I was pushing myself and trying to do everything, I would be irritable. I would be more reactive at work to bad things happening. And have you ever had a day when there weren't obstacles and challenges and things happening that you're not happy with? So that's the well-being. In terms of wisdom, it's because we see so many people making bad decisions who are smarter than they appear. You know, Bill Clinton, I quote him in the book saying, the most important mistakes are made, I made when I was tired. Mm -hmm. He did not specify what mistakes. <laughs> but, <I guess. laughs> but you know, one can look back and say, maybe he should have had an eight hour sleep. I know from myself that so often life became about results, and that's not enough. I want to bring joy into my daily life. I don't want just to be effective, because as far as I know, that's the only life we have, and we all know it's much more fragile than we think. And I don't like putting my life on hold and seeing my friends and colleagues putting their lives on hold until they complete the next project, until they get the next promotion, until they get the man they want. This is it, this is life, this is not a dress rehearsal. So one of the things, and you, you mentioned it when you were talking in the beginning about connectivity, and I think it's especially interesting because a lot of people here are in advertising, we're very connected, we're you know, a business that's always on. In the book you say every six and a half minutes people are checking their smartphones. Yesterday I was on the plane coming here and the Wi-Fi didn't work and I was getting so stressed. But then I thought, wait a second, <laughs> you're thinking of this wrong, you know, try to relax. What do you suggest are some ways, because it's very easy for somebody, you know, who's very successful to say, okay, I'm not gonna do that as much. But if you're in a job where you, you don't have the luxury of saying, I'm gonna get back to my boss tomorrow or much later, what do you suggest about how someone can be a little less connected? Well, two things. The first is that, as I said, 35% of American companies now have introduced some form of stress reduction practice because they're becoming more aware of the impact this has on their healthcare costs and on productivity. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a global shift because I'm sure many of you are in global companies. Volkswagen, for example, has introduced a policy where they give their managers company smartphones which automatically go off at 6 p.m. and come on again at 7 a.m. So there's a, a greater awareness over the last year, that's happened very recently, of the dangers of being always on. Yeah. Because people are realize that we pay our employees for their judgment, not their stamina. Mm -hmm. And if they're always on, they're not going to be their best. And after all, creativity is the key now as more and more parts of our jobs yeah. are being taken over by algorithms and technology. And if you're always at work also, you really have no chance to be inspired by other things. Exactly. And I think, you know, even if you are like at, the, at an entry point, at an entry level, mm -hmm. and let's say you're in a company where there are 
still living in the dark ages about all these things. You know, you can present what works for you in a way that is very respectful, that says, you know, well, you do a fantastic job when you are on, and then you say, if you need me over the weekend, you know, here's my cell phone, call me or text me. And that gives a message that I'm not going to be on email, but I'm also available if there is a real need for me to be there, rather than the fact that you want everybody available 24-7 which is basically not a win-win. And it's important to set that up earlier in your career because isn't that what your book is talking about is figuring out a, a life plan for how you can you know, navigate your career? Yes, and obviously there's going to be flexibility, but I know at the Huffington Post where we have a lot of young people, we have an email policy where they are not expected to be on after they leave work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been put in writing, everybody has it. We also offer yoga, meditation, breathing classes, and so that way they get a sense that they are really valued as human beings. And that culture is incredibly important when it comes to recruitment and retention. Yeah. So in the same vein of connectivity, I'd like to talk a little bit about social media because in your book you say, um, and I had just said this to you before, just because something is trending on Twitter doesn't mean it really has any relevance except for the next like five minutes. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of people here, we're, we're encouraged that, you know, we're always figuring out ways to be more active on social media. We're encouraging our clients to be on social media. What do you feel is the best way to be using social media? Well, one very interesting thing that's happening, why I'm very optimistic that these changes are really being implemented, is that in newsrooms in the past, you know, the, the saying was, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, you put bad news on, rape, mayhem, and people are going to tune in and read. Now we are finding that the content that goes most viral, that <coughs> most works in social media, is either content that puts a spotlight on good things happening, like acts of generosity and compassion, mm -hmm. or content that helps people lead better, less stressful lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, at Half Post, we've done all that. Last month, our healthy living section, you know, we started as a politics and news section, for those of you who remember back nine years ago. And our politics side is still the number one politics side in America. But last month, our healthy living say, site, that is one of the sites that deals with these issues, beat the politics site in traffic. And a lot of it was through social media and through referrals, because people love to pass these stories on. Yeah. Uh, just to give you an example, we had one blog written by a mother, a special ed teacher, and the, the title was, The Day I Stopped Saying Hurry Up to My Daughter. It was a very moving, beautiful blog about how she realized one day that the two words she spoke most often to her little daughter, six-year-old, whom she loved more than anything in the world, were hurry up. Hurry up and get up, hurry up and have breakfast, hurry up and go to school, hurry up and go to bed. And, and she began to notice the stress she was creating in her daughter, which is also the stress we create in ourselves because we treat ourselves the same way. And that piece got 1.2 million likes on Facebook. It was read by 7 million people. She was on the Today Show and she got a book contract. I love these stories because it's, uh, people resonate with this content now more than ever because we are all searching to lead lives that have less stress, more fulfillment. We are kind of realizing that we are at a turning point and the way we've been doing things is not sustainable. And that's reflected in social media and in what's working in social media. And we work a lot with brands. Mm -hmm. We are finding that brands are recognizing that and want to focus on what they're doing around wellness and what they're doing around giving. So just talking about hurrying up, that brings us to time. And you mentioned briefly um, in your opening remarks about time famine, which I think is really interesting. And I'd love if you could just talk a little bit more about that. We all have felt that. Uh, when we are feeling kind of overwhelmed by life, everything is coming at us at incredible speed. And if you look at the language that we use in our emails, in our communications, it's often, you know, I'm swamped, um, I'll, I'll respond to you when I come up for air. We need to create the kind of pauses and space in our lives that take some of that stress away. And I've been practicing that. And I find that because I was such a hard case, uh, God or whatever you believe in, actually not only made me write this book, but talk about it every day. So I'm reinforcing the messages for myself. 
So I'm actually, when I begin to feel rushed inside, I become very aware of how I can take deep breaths. I have little, little tips like that in the book that we can do and put things in perspective in our minds and realize that really this is the, the moment we have. We can only do one thing at a time, which is very different to our idea that multitasking is efficient because it's not. You know, in fact, again, I have a lot of scientific evidence that will show you that multitasking is really task switching. You're not doing two things at once. You're just going from one thing to another, and it's the most stressful thing you can do. So I like in the book when you say, when you, you talk about the importance of breathing, and you say, it's easy to be busy while not being aware of, that you're actually living. Yes. So, so I guess you mention all different things thr throughout the book in terms of things you can do to breathing, being outside, having a pet. Yes. You know, how, how easy, though, is it really to integrate these kind of things in your life, and how do you think people should start doing it? By very small microscopic steps that anybody can do right now, and it's much easier than we think. If we, if we approach it step by step, rather than wanting to do everything overnight and do a complete overhaul, which is what we often want to do. If I can give you three little steps, how is that, that anybody can do? Like tonight, unless you're one of the wise few who get all the sleep they need, and you know how you know that? You wake up without an alarm, because you cannot oversleep. You can overeat, but you cannot oversleep. So unless you're one of those people, get 30 minutes more sleep tonight, which may mean giving up on Jon Stewart, you know, or binging on uh, House of Cards, or finishing your last emails, whatever. You may require sacrificing something, but trust me, you're going to feel so much better in the morning, number one. Number two, at the end of your day, gently escort all your devices out of your bedroom. <laughs> and charge them somewhere else. Because if you charge your smartphone by your bed and you wake up at night for whatever reason, you are going to be tempted to look at your data, especially if you have any trouble falling back asleep. And again, read the science in the book. It's just amazing. Your sleep isn't going to be as recharging as it would be if you don't allow your day life with all its challenges and problems to intrude into your time for restoration and renewal. I was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner on Saturday night in Washington, and one of our guests at the half post table was Richard um, Simmons, who was Richard Sherman, who, was, who is the, um, from the Seattle Seahawks. And he was telling me how they are prioritizing sleep and yoga and meditation, and he said how they worked with him to make his sleep deeper and how much more effective he's in the field. This is not new agey, flaky Californian stuff. <laughs> you know, this is real science, real data, um, that is pretty conclusive. And one th last one, because it's not just about our bodies, it's also about our minds, is at the end of the day, drop something, an emotion, um, negative self-talk or a project that no longer serves you. It could be resentment, a grudge. You know, I have a quote from Carrie Fisher who said, resentment is the poison you drink thinking somebody else will die. <laughs> or projects. You know how sometimes we come up with projects we think we want to do, but realistically we're not going to invest energy into doing them? Um, and I do that regularly. I, for example, one of my projects was, because my daughters love to ski, I wanted to become a good skier. I'm now a terrible skier. And then I realized, you know what, I'm not really going to invest the time to become a good skier. So it was very liberating to realize that you can complete a project by dropping it. <laughs> so now when they go skiing, I sit down and um, by the fire, drink hot chocolate and read a good book. <laughs> But are you one of those people that has to finish the whole book? See, I'm no, one of those people. you are. But yeah. you see, that's the thing. You can now complete the book by dropping it. <laughs> Talking about changing uh, things in your head, your mother sounds like she was such a remarkable woman, and you mentioned an anecdote. One of the ones that I love in the book is when, when, you, when there was something that was upsetting you, and she would say, darling, change the channel. You're in control of the clicker. Yes. I think... Why do you think it's so hard for people to do that, and I think especially women? First of all, it is much harder for women, you are right, because we have that voice in our head that in the book I call the obnoxious roommate living right. in my head, 
which uh, puts us down, which um, is full of doubts and negative self-talk and judgments. And so when we become aware that this voice is not the truth and this voice is not who we are, it's much easier to, to lower the volume. Mm -hmm. And mine was very, very intense and very sardonic. When I was on Stephen Colbert recently, I told him that my obnoxious roommate sounded exactly like him. <laughs> But now she only makes guest appearances. So we can, you know, we can work with that voice, which is what is one of the most stressful things we do to ourselves. Talking about talking to yourself, I really thought it was interesting also in the book, the way you talk about intuition and how you should listen more to your intuition. Could you just talk a little bit about that to all of us? Yes, I think it's just amazing. I just think back on all the things that we know, but we don't acknowledge that we know. I mean, people we work with, people we hire that we shouldn't have hired. We all know we have an enormous amount of inner wisdom, intuition, and knowledge. But we kind of block it, either because we are burnt out and we're just going down our to-do list and crossing things off, or because we've come to believe that our mind is the only thing that matters. And unless our mind can give us a reason why, we are kind of canceling. Trust me, everything I'm saying, I've done in the extreme. And I'm still a work in progress. I'm not doing any of this perfectly. But I know that I remember there were days when I would wake up happy and my mind would cancel the feeling because it could not give me a reason why I should be happy. <laughs> You know, so that's kind of the extreme, instead of sort of really connecting with that inner wisdom and inner joy and intuition. I want to change the gears just a teeny bit. One of the uh, things that interests me very much is whether women can have it all. And on my show Perspectives, I've talked to so many different women. And, you know, that's always really the premise. And I read in your book that you say that even the phrase having it all, no matter how it's debated, is in effect implying that we're not measuring up somehow. Yes, even this term um, to me is just, again, not particularly helpful for women. First of all, because normally when we say have, having it all, we tend to measure it in terms of the two metrics. And having it all has to include, you know, all the other dimensions that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And also because sometimes hidden under this language of, you know, you go girl, is the sense that we are not measuring up, you know, that we are not measuring up because we don't have the corner office, we're not measuring up because we don't have color-coded recipe cards, or whatever it is that that other super women have while they're doing everything else as well. Or, and, and I think that is also what creates a lot of comparisons. And I feel that one of the worst things we can do to ourselves is comparing ourselves to someone else because we are all so unique. And our uniqueness is what we need to celebrate. And that, when we celebrate that, it is just amazing how all the other things fall by the wayside. Because also, really, I mean, having it all, you have to really think to yourself, like, what does having it all mean to you? Because it's probably not what you thought it meant or what society is telling you that it should mean. Right, or, or what it means to you or to someone else here. You say in the book also that it will be women who will uh, redefine success beyond money and power. And then you mentioned, you know, this third revolution. I, and that sounds so interesting. Can you just talk more about your thoughts on that? When we look around now, we see that the way we've been running our workplaces is not sustainable from any point of view. Um, Seventy-five percent of healthcare costs in America are because of stress-related, chronic and preventable diseases. Mm -hmm. So we see the impact that stress and burnout have on heart disease, on diabetes, on high blood pressure. And that's when we begin to look purely in terms of what's sustainable for the future that we need to change. And I feel because the world the way it is now was designed by men, uh, women have less invested in it. Although, trust me, when we change it, men are going to be incredibly grateful to us. <laughs> so we talked about so much stuff, so many things in the book. What do you really want people to take away from this book? The most important thing I want people to take away is that there is a way to have big dreams, to accomplish a lot of things, and to do it with more grace and less struggle, and to do it with less stress and more joy. And absolutely, this is not just me speaking from my personal experience. What is great now is that we can have this 
three strands coalescing, and that's what I've done in the book. I have my personal journey, and I have the science on all these aspects that we're discussing, and then we have best practices from companies, from individuals. <coughs> I'm hoping that we don't have to wake up just through painful wake-up calls. People say that the only way you change is through pain. I want to disprove that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping that here we are. Why not learn from each other's stories? Why not learn from science? Why not learn from poetry? I have filled the book with inspirational quotes that have meant a lot to me. One of my favorites is from Rumi, the poet who said, give life, live life as though everything is rigged in your favor. I love that because it helps us focus on the blessings and the gratitude rather than all the things that are not going well. Another favorite quote that I have is from Ian Thomas, who said, every day the world will grab you by the hand and say, this is important, and this is important, and this is important, and you must worry about this, and you must worry about that. And you must yank your hand back and put it on your heart and say, no, this is important. And the more we do that, the more we're going to be rewarded and the truly richer our lives will become. And that will be its own incentive to do more of that. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It's very simple. Very simple. Mm -hmm.